Am I the arsehole for uninviting my sister-in-law who is in love with my husband? Story time. So my husband and I met each other at Ski Lodge about nine years ago. We'll call him Steve. I was with my friends, my sister and my children and he was with his brothers and sisters and a couple of his friends as well. We'd been talking throughout the night and my friends and his friends set us up so we'd have to sing together. It was very high school musical vibes. And even at this point, I could catch on to my sister-in-law's disturbing behaviour. After we had done our little song, we went to the cafe to have a little chat afterwards to get to know each other a bit more. The middle sister, who we'll call Amy, came storming up to us. And for some context, Amy was adopted at birth, so she's not a biological sister at all. She was demanding that he return back to their group. She didn't look at me once and then whined when he told her no. She actually ran off crying and then locked herself in the room, so everybody else in that room had to stay in someone else's room. It was quite the inconvenience. Fast forward to when we bought a house together. We invited our friends and family, and of course, Amy was there. But she turned up wearing this like a really skimpy sexy little clubbing outfit to a housewarming party with friends and family she literally ignored me the whole entire time and hung off my husband the whole time she kept kissing him on the cheek hugging him she touched his arm whenever he made her laugh this girl was flirting with her own brother people commented about how she looked like the girlfriend and i looked like some random girl she was going around telling everybody about how he'd always said that he didn't want kids but now he's changed his tune and is playing daddy to my daughter she even went as far as to talk about how hot his modeling pictures were from when he'd done them in college and if you think this is bad things got even worse at the end of the night this was the night when steve proposed to me and as soon as he got down on one knee this bitch started crying and she ran to the bathroom their dad went to go check on her and then he ended up driving her straight home after that we didn't see her for years she skipped our wedding she skipped the baby shower for our new baby she skipped family parties i was absolutely fine inviting her to stop because i knew she wouldn't actually turn up she ended up having some sort of mental breakdown and was in and out of treatment for years after this. I wish this girl all the best, but I don't want her disrupting my peace. I just really hope that she gets well again. So I'm currently pregnant and our baby shower is at the end of this month. So my mother-in-law RSVP'd and said that Amy would actually be coming this time and asked if it was okay if she could bring her new boyfriend. And I'm not gonna lie, I was a little bit apprehensive to agree. Well, it took all of 24 hours after this for her to start her old ways. She was texting my husband paragraphs at like 3 a.m. talking about how I destroyed the family and how I'd ruined their relationship. She was asking if he really was happy with his life because he had always said that he didn't want kids, but after I came along, it kind of changed his mind. She then was asking if he had ever thought about her this whole time when they'd not been speaking. That was the last straw for me. I asked him if he was aware of the fact that his sister was in love with him. And Steve had just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I don't really doubt your theory. He opened up about the fact that when they were 11, she had asked him if they could cuddle and kiss. And he obviously said no. He admitted that since then, her behaviour had always been a little bit strange and dramatic. I then asked him if he would uninvite for the baby shower because I was convinced that this girl was going to bring all the drama and I was not in the mood. And he said that he needs to speak to his parents first to see what type of state she's in. So what do you think? My friend's divorce is dividing my husband and I. My husband, 37 male, and I, 40 female, have been happily married for 10 years. Minor bumps along the way, but nothing we couldn't communicate about or work through. Until now. My best friend Cindy and her husband Mike are going through a nasty divorce and it has caused a serious rift between my husband and I. I didn't realize how serious it was until this morning when he told me he was going to go stay at his brother's house for the weekend. To understand the current situation, there is a bit of background I need to provide. Four years ago, my husband's close friend Alan was caught having an affair on his wife. We'll call her Carol. I was good friends with Carol. Not super close, but we'd get together for cocktails a few times a month and occasionally we'd go on double dates. My husband told me that Alan had been unhappy for a while because Carol had stopped having intimacy with him. When I talked to Carol, she didn't deny this. She said that Alan had gained weight and she was no longer attracted to him. This is somewhat true. He was around six feet tall and went from about 200 pounds to 250 pounds over the course of a year. Those are estimates. Alan was a chef and started sleeping with a female coworker, 15 years younger than him. He was 35, she was 20. The affair lasted some time before they were caught at work. It all came out, he was fired, and Carol left him. Cheating hits very close to home for me. My father had an affair on my mother when I was young, and it ripped the family apart. Carol and Alan had two young children, and the divorce hit them hard. I was there for her and the kids through it all. The divorce was ugly and costly. Suffice to say, it would take Alan years to financially recover. Throughout the whole ordeal, my husband still talked to Alan and would occasionally loan him money. The money isn't the issue, as my husband and I both work and have our own accounts. The issue was that Alan had just cheated on his wife and ruined their family. I didn't want my husband remaining friends with him. Alan started drinking and going down a dark path. He was trying to drag my husband down with him. I told my husband if he continues his friendship with Alan, then we would have problems. 
After some back and forth and me basically putting my foot down, he agreed to basically cut Alan out. We didn't need influences or other people like that in our life. I should mention that my husband says he didn't know about the affair, which I still question, but without proof, he knew I let it go. Alan was extremely upset when my husband told him they are no longer friends. They had grown up together, but I didn't want men like that in our life. Shortly after all of this, we started reflecting on everything, and my husband said something that I never forgot. He said, one day, one of your friends will do something they regret and need you. I hope you have the same wherewithal to cut them out if I ask you to. Cut to the present and you guessed it. My bestie Cindy cheated on her husband, Mike. Mike worked in a manufacturing and was laid off in the midst of COVID. He eventually went back to work, but at a much lower wage, according to her. And money was tight for them. Cindy picked up a job working as a barista. As she tells it, one of her regulars was a young guy in real estate who had an eye for her and was constantly asking her to get together. He would slip her $100 tips a few times a week, she says. He knew she was married. Eventually, Cindy gave in and started seeing this guy regularly on her days off while Mike was working. She told me she always felt guilty and knew what she was doing was wrong, but couldn't stop herself. She said that the intimacy was like nothing she'd ever experienced with Mike and she felt wanted and desired again. They were caught when their oldest daughter came home early from school because she wasn't feeling well. Cindy was busy with her affair partner, didn't see the text from her daughter, and her daughter walked in on them. The daughter told Mike Mike was devastated and they are getting a divorce. The family has basically ostracized Cindy and want nothing to do with her currently. I and a few friends have been supporting her through everything. I need to say that I recognize what she did was terrible. However, my husband has pounced on the opportunity and is demanding I cut her off completely, just like I did him four years ago. He says, we don't need cheating cradle robbers in our lives. I explained that this was different and that the issues between Mike and Cindy are more complicated as she feels genuine remorse and wants her family back. Also, what his friend did years ago was creepy. He says he doesn't care about the issues or how she feels, that he made a sacrifice for me years ago by cutting out one of his closest friends, and I need to do the same for him. I told him I wasn't going to do that, and he was being petty and vengeful, as he knows the situations are completely different. This morning, he said he's headed to his brother's for the weekend. He says he feels betrayed. I honestly don't see how he feels this way. I don't know what to do. I asked him not to go. I told him I love him, and we can talk this out. He responded with, I'll see you Monday. I'm at a loss. I just realized my wife doesn't love me. Today I came to the realization that my wife doesn't love me. She said she does, but her actions over the years show that she doesn't. She loves the life that I have given her, but not necessarily me. My wife is a lovely person, whom I adore and treat like a queen. She had been working up until about three years ago when she was diagnosed with the disease. She would at times help with household chores when we were first married, but doesn't help with any daily housework. She doesn't clean, vacuum, wash clothes, do yard work. She pretty much just does the dishes and that's it. She doesn't make much money now that she's on disability. She contributes little monetarily. The amount she contributes basically covers her cell phone bill and cable TV bill. I pay everything else each month. She does treatments every night but goes to bed around 2 a.m. and wakes up anywhere between noon and 1. There are many times where she wouldn't do anything for my birthday or Father's Day. I am a giver and shower her with nice gifts for special occasions and gifts just because I love her. I mean, I'm talking Louis Vuitton purses, bags, diamonds, and nice shoes. Sex is non-existent and I've always had to initiate it. The thing that really has been in the back of my mind is something that happened last year. Last August, I had a heart attack. I was feeling bad when I went to bed and woke up at 4 a.m. with really bad chest pain. I went downstairs to find the blood pressure cap to see what was going on. It was really high. I started sweating, had a hard time breathing, and sick to my stomach. I sat down for a few minutes, I looked up signs of a heart attack, and I had them all. I drank some water and felt a tiny bit better. I decided to drive to the hospital. I know it was stupid, but it's a fairly straight shot, and it was early in the morning. I got to the hospital, and they fast-tracked me through and started running tests. My wife woke up at 11 and noticed I wasn't home and tracked me. She texted me, and I told her I was in the ER, and they thought I had a heart attack, and I had all of the markers. She came to pick up the car and dropped off a couple of things. She then left and went to dinner with her friend. The next day, I'm still in the hospital and I was hurt she went to dinner when I'm in the ER. I told her not to come up and well, she didn't. She only came up to pick me up to go home. She's been in the hospital about six or seven times. I would visit her every day when she was in the hospital. I would bring her flowers and treats. I would wait in the ER every time to keep her company. I only missed one day and that was because she was supposed to be released and I was waiting till she was sprung. This has been sitting on me for the last year. It's not getting better. We had a fight that I instigated today. I told her how hurt I was and she said my feelings always get hurt. I asked her if her mother, sister, or grandfather was in the ER with the heart attack, would she go back home to be with them? And she said yes. 
After that, I knew she wasn't in love with me, just loves what I give her. She doesn't understand that she isn't giving any back in return. She is like a roommate at this point. A roommate that doesn't pay rent or help take care of the house or do much of anything to make my life better. My girlfriend 25 female repeatedly insists that I redo my proposal over and over. I 24 male proposed to my girlfriend in late 2019 after two years together. Admittedly, now that I think back on it, it wasn't the most well thought out or planned proposal. It was mostly spontaneous and came as we were lying in bed together, so I didn't even have a ring at the time. At the time, my girlfriend said that she would love to marry me, but she had been looking forward to a more elaborate proposal. I assured her that I'd sort something out. A month later, after shopping for the perfect ring, I set up some candles when she was coming home one day, think the Chandler, Monica proposal and friends, and asked her again. Well, my girlfriend loved the ring, thankfully, and cheered up with happiness. She said that she really appreciated my effort Effort, but what she meant by elaborate was something original that she could tell our kids about one day. She mentioned the name of one of her friends whose boyfriend we both know proposed by making a huge video montage of their time together and putting it on a projector. I decided to start over and in February, I planned a three night trip away in our favorite city. This time I spared no expense and ordered all the extras, a five star hotel, a photographer, even an opera quartet. When I asked her to marry me, my girlfriend said yes and I thought all was well. Except when we were alone again, she gently told me that she didn't think think now was the right time and she was so worried about her future slash COVID-19 that a proposal now wouldn't be a good memory for her. Since then, I've carried the ring around with me almost everywhere. At this point, I've even tried to involve my girlfriend in some of the proposal planning, asking where, when, how she'd like us to get engaged and what would make her happy. However, all she has told me is that she doesn't know exactly what she's looking for and I'll know when the right proposal comes. From my perspective, this is hugely frustrating since in all other respects, she's assured me that she wants to begin our lives together. Last week, I thought I'd bite the bullet again and after cooking her a homemade meal, I asked her if she'd like to be my wife. She asked me if I was trying to propose and I asked her what was wrong with that. Once more, she told me that she can't wait to marry me, but it still wasn't quite the proposal she needed. Honestly, at this point, I'm frustrated. I realize that my girlfriend might come off as pushy or high maintenance in this post, but I love her very much and in day-to-day -day life, she's honestly the most understanding, chill person to be around. However, I don't understand why she's acting this way and what I'm supposed to do to satisfy her with the perfect proposal at this point. I'm confused and running out of patience. Am I the asshole for not liking how my girlfriend dressed? for work so I 43 male don't think I'm in the wrong here but my mother is very angry at me and my best friend said I was a horrible person for saying what I did and I'd be lucky if my girlfriend didn't put me out with the garbage since I decided I wanted to act like trash my girlfriend 34 female is a preschool teacher and for some reason I can't explain she dresses like Miss Frizzle like a dress with the pattern of whatever they are studying she makes a lot of them herself now including matching masks the kids love it and the parents seem to think it's great. I don't like the amount of attention she gets, honestly. I'd prefer if she came home and changed before running any errands. On Friday, she helped my mom with something after work and she was still in her weird dress. I have told her before I don't like when she dresses that way, but she tells me I don't have to like it, but I have no right to tell her how to dress. I was upset she went out like that with my mother and told her that my mom said she was embarrassed and to ask that she please not dress like that again if they're going out. I was not expecting her to call my mom and apologize. When my mom asked what she meant, she told her what I said. My mom was furious, explained she doesn't have a problem with how my girlfriend dresses, and thinks it's great she spends extra time doing things to engage her students. My mom then yelled at me for lying to my girlfriend and trying to throw her under the bus because I was being an insecure jerk. My girlfriend and I got into a huge fight. I said she should be embarrassed to be seen in public like that. She said the only things she was embarrassed by was me. She hasn't spoken to me or done anything for me since. My friend said I was horrible and called me trash. I shouldn't have lied, but I think my girlfriend should take what I think about her clothes into consideration, and I'm not sorry for expecting her to dress more appropriately in public. Am I really such an asshole here? Edit, I'm sure you will all be pleased to know we broke up tonight. She said I'm too controlling and narrow-minded, so she broke up with me. I've been holding on to this secret for more than a decade, and the guilt has been gnawing away at me my entire adult life. In order to tell this story, I need to take you back to high school when I was 15 years old. I was a pretty typical teenager in that I had desperately low self-esteem and a huge crush on the most popular boy in my year level, Matt. I loved basically everything about him, but there was one unavoidable issue. He wanted nothing to do with me. After months of pining for him, I noticed that he had a type. Girls who are edgier, cooler and more mysterious than myself. While it might not make a heap of sense now, at that time of my life, I grew convinced that in order to make Matt fall in love with me, I needed to find out more about him. 
I felt that if I just had the chance to talk to him a little bit, get to know his interests and hobbies and quirks, I could grow closer to him in the real world. And that's where Eliza came in. Eliza was a fake online identity I created for myself in order to get closer to Matt. I found someone on social media who had the kind of look Matt found attractive, downloaded their photos, and created an email to go along with it. Eliza was who I desperately wanted to be, a girl who perfected all of my real-world insecurities. She was bubbly, outgoing, completely beautiful and charming. From there, I made a Facebook account and added people from my school, including Matt. What shocked me the most about being Eliza was how instantly Matt and I connected. Our conversations were great. We had so much to talk about and relate to each other on. As the days and weeks passed, Matt told me he had feelings for me, which felt like complete validation, as if my hunch that we'd actually make a great couple had always been bang on. Only, of course, Matt wasn't in love with the real me. He was in love with Eliza. I knew it was all so wrong, and that there was a natural time limit on how long I could keep the facade going, but if I'm honest with you both, the high of the thrill from catfishing was enough motivation to keep going. It was such a small decision on one day that snowballed into a huge, all-consuming thing. Being Eliza was like a drug for me. The more Matt liked Eliza, the more I wanted to be her, and the more I lent into the fake world I had created. After a while, it wasn't just Eliza whose fake life I was inhabiting. I created a whole network of people who legitimized Eliza's existence, a web of interconnected friends and acquaintances who could keep my alternate reality alive. I even started using my mum's phone to give Eliza a phone number where the boys could call and text me. This went on for years and eventually consumed my high school experience. It extended far beyond Matt too. Eventually I found myself talking to Matt's circle of friends and even connected Eliza with my real life self. Through Eliza, I told the boys that we were friends, which I felt would make them warm to the real me and see me as interesting and likeable. And it kind of worked, only it also made everything so much more complicated too. Eliza would continually set up plans with Matt and his friends and, of course, continually flake out on them. I would get their hopes up and then crush them time and time again with stupid excuses as to why I couldn't meet them. I saw them grow more frustrated and embarrassed with every broken promise over the years, and yet I didn't do anything to fix it. Naturally, over time, I was exposed. The boys figured out Eliza's phone number was actually my mother's. They never confronted me about my secret in person, but the shame and mental spiral I found myself in was so significant that I stopped going to school. Soon after, I dropped out altogether. I've barely seen the men I catfished since. But on the rare occasion that I've seen any of them at a pub or bar, I've avoided all contact and been consumed with shame. I never owned up to what I did to them, and I never apologised either. I've never come clean to my best friend, who was on the periphery of all this for years and who I knew felt confused about who Eliza was. I feel such immense regret over it all. I wasted so much time and hurt so many people. For so long, I refused to let myself think deeply about it, but now that I've started as an adult, I can't stop. How can I let go and forgive myself completely? Sometimes I consider contacting Matt and letting him know how much it haunts me or confessing to my best friend what I did all those years ago, but I don't want to open a deep can of worms that won't help them. I just want to move on, but I don't know how. Am I the asshole for telling my soon-to-be niece that she doesn't need to wear a dress to my wedding? I, 32 female, am getting married to my fiancé, 41 male, next year. After we got engaged, I suggested it might be nice if I asked my fiancé's niece, who's 15, if she wanted to be a bridesmaid too. I've only met her a couple of times, so we're not close, but she seemed like a cool kid and I thought it might be a nice way for us to bond, slash get to know each other, slash involve her in the wedding. Side note, she's the only niece or nephew on either side of the family. Anyway, cut to a few weeks ago and we're in my fiancé's hometown to visit his family and discuss wedding-related stuff. His brother, sister-in-law, and their daughter came over, and I noticed this time that she was dressed a lot more androgynous than I remembered. The topic moved to wedding dresses and bridesmaids dresses, and I can see she was immediately uncomfortable. Her parents, her mom really, and grandma were making comments about how she'd need to be more feminine, brush her hair, etc., and how nice it would be to see her like that. I'll be honest and say this hit a nerve with me, as I was very much a tomboy as a teenager, even though I'm not anymore, and it absolutely broke me whenever my relatives would say things like that. 
Eventually, her mother made a comment along the lines of, it'll be nice to see you dress like a girl for once, and she looked really sad, embarrassed, and upset. In response, because that really hit a nerve, I immediately told her that my maid of honor would be wearing a trouser suit for the wedding and not a dress, and that I'd given all the bridesmaids the options of wearing anything they want as long as it's in the wedding color, to make things easier. I pulled out my phone and started showing her photos of the ideas my friend had sent me. A jumpsuit, a trouser suit, a tailored tux, etc. And let her know that she could pick anything at all she wanted. She could even wear jeans and trainers if that made her comfortable. And that it's a wedding, not a fashion show. My niece perked up a bit when I said that, but her mom looked really pissed off. She's since asked my fiancé to pressure me into getting all the bridesmaids dresses so their daughter will have to wear one, which lol no. My husband doesn't give a shit what she wears, but obviously also doesn't want his family and me to be arguing on the wedding day. I don't want to back down because I know what it feels like to be pressured into wearing something that makes you uncomfortable, but on the other hand, I know it's only for a day and it'd make the family happy. Am I the asshole for trying to overrule her parents? Am I the asshole for not wanting a ring my fiancé already gave to another girl? My now fiancé was engaged a couple years before we got together, and when they broke up, she gave the ring back. We've been together a few years and a few days ago he proposed and I was super excited. The ring looked kind of familiar and when I asked him where it was from, he said it was the ring he gave his ex fiance I immediately took it off and was like, I don't want a ring you bought for someone else. It wasn't meant for me. He got upset and said it didn't matter because it's not hers anymore, it's mine. My family and friends are split in saying I'm the asshole and I'm justified. I don't want him to spend a whole other thousand dollars on a ring for me, but I want a ring that was meant for me, not for someone else. Update, we broke up like two weeks after the post. He didn't like that I posted about it on Reddit, therefore he said he definitely wasn't going to buy me a new ring and called me a bridezilla. I pretty much told him, cool, get out of my house. That was about a month ago. He has a new girlfriend who will probably get the same hand-me-down, ugly-ass ring he already gave to two other girls. Am I the asshole for refusing to wet myself for my sister-in-law's wedding? The wedding happened in a little river, and I mean in the river, in the water. The minister, the bride, who's my husband's sister, and the groom stood on a little strip of land so they weren't wet. But all attendants were expected to stand in knee-deep rushing water for the whole ceremony. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because I would be the asshole right along with you. Because I'm not, I'm not about to get dressed to go to your wedding to stand in the fucking river. No. The, the, the dress requirements for this motherfucker better have been a goddamn wetsuit or a bathing suit. Because who the fuck? No. No. <laughs> Hell, this can't be fucking. Hell no. Nah. I'm sure it made for great photos, but I personally really dislike mud, germs, insects, and whatever diseases are found in that stream. No, for real. Like, I was thinking the same thing. Me, my luck, I'm going to fuck around and stick myself on something floating in the water and I'm going to catch malaria or some shit in my leg. Hell no. Nah. Fuck no. No. Mm -mm. I am right along with you, bro. We would have been assholes together. Because no. Hell, and the bugs? Oh, no. The wedding would have been ruined. Ruined the moment I thought I felt something touch my foot. Hell <laughs> no. The kids who couldn't stand easily in water that might be as tall as their whole body were left in ankle deep water nearby with a couple of older women. When I refused to remove my shoes, socks, and pull up my dress pants, my husband offered that I stay with the kids. I said, no, I refuse to walk into that water even if it's just ankle deep. Apparently, most people there knew about the water thing, but I didn't. And my husband knew, but claims he forgot to tell me. He didn't fucking forget. He knew that you were going to say no, and he figured once you were there, you were just going to do it. Fuck that. Hell no. <laughs> no. No. Mm -mm. The ceremony could have easily moved forward with me standing on the shore, just a few feet away from the kids. But no, the bride and groom apparently refused to start until every person was in the water. Why? This is their wedding. Why didn't they just keep going on? Like, what the fuck? My husband waited in the water back and forth between his sister and I to mediate. Really? Uh, really? My husband was becoming visibly angry at me the longer it went on and kept acting like I was in the wrong. The bride and groom eventually relented and the ceremony went on, delayed by maybe 30 minutes. During the after party, I felt that I was being avoided by everyone else, including my husband. Girl, at that point, I just wouldn't went home. <laughs> like, all right, bro, you better catch a ride or call an uber because y'all just gonna keep looking at me like i ruined the fucking day i'm gonna go home <laughs> i'm gonna go to mcdonald's give me a cheeseburger and i'm gonna just go home because <laughs> what the fuck like what 
All right, so first of all, no, I don't think you're the asshole because I don't think you made a big deal or made a scene about it. Like, who the fuck would have known that you weren't in the water if they didn't make a deal about you not being in the water? And second of all, the bride and groom are the assholes because, bitch, how you expect me to get washed away by the river but your ass standing up there on the land dry as shit? No, bitch, scoot over. Let me get some land. Hell no. Nah. No, I don't think you're the asshole at all. Like, now, if you would have made a big stink about it, like, hell no, nah, screaming and yelling about how you not getting in the water, absolutely. But I don't think you did. And your husband wading in the water back and fucking forth just brought that much attention to you when they could have just walked away and left you standing dry and went on about their fucking day. And honestly, everybody looking at you at the after party, they're just jealous because they all wet from the knee down and you over there dry as a goddamn bone. So, hell no, nah, you are not the asshole. I'm about to tell my husband he's selfish and needs to grow the fuck up. So my husband hosts a party every year for his birthday. His mates come over and play board games, video games, and spend the weekend being very loud, messy, and generally being pains in the ass. For years, these boys, I would not call them men, have treated my husband's home as a frat house, leaving rubbish everywhere, not cleaning up after themselves, not closing doors, and if they do, not quietly. These boys are highly qualified. All of them have one or more degrees and yet have no common sense and no respect for others. Last year, some of them left food out that was toxic for dogs and my dogs got into it. It wasn't even brought into the house. It was just left outside where the dogs were. 6 a.m. phone calls to my vet was not what I needed to be doing on my weekend off. So this year, I made the decision that the dogs were off of the property and staying at a kennel. My husband has announced that even though next year we will have an eight month old, he's still going to have the event and myself and the child can basically leave for that weekend. Oh, hell no, no, no. I will not pack up my eight, eight month old and take them somewhere else for you and your disrespectful punk ass friends to destroy my house and probably nine times out of 10, leave it for me to clean up absolutely the fuck not i would have put my foot down so long ago the first time when my goddamn dog got sick because you guys were being fucking lazy that's when your husband's birthday party became a bachelor fucking brunch like hell no nah. y'all want to do some stupid shit take your asses over to goddamn denny's have some pancakes and some orange juice and call it a fucking day because now <laughs> you're being dis no i'm not leaving my motherfucking house I might add that for my birthdays, he does nothing. He forgets it and does nothing for it. At the end of this weekend, I'm going to be calling him selfish and telling him to grow the fuck up. Okay, so my issue is not even the fact that they're loud and they're messy and they're pains in the ass and they're slamming doors because that they're men. They're, they're letting loose and that's what the fuck men do when they let loose. My problem is the fact that you nasty motherfuckers at y'all grown ass ages don't clean up after yourselves. Like, no, your husband is a punk. He needs to stop being such a pushover to his friends and tell them to clean the fuck up. Because the one reason this shit is continuously happening at y'all house is because his friends ain't gonna let that shit go down at their house because they don't want to deal with the mess. They're not going to clean up. They know your husband's not going to stop it. If anything, he's going to fucking encourage it because he's a pussy. Oh, hell no. Nah. I could not be married to this man. I would leave and tell him that I'm not fucking coming back until you prove to me that my house is clean facetime me sunday evening show me that my house is clean i don't want to see a speck a spoon nothing you know what take the fucking dogs to the groomers before i get home <laughs> i want my house to, you know how you walk in in the cartoons and, and the house go bing with the sparkle i need to see fucking sparkles every goddamn where before i come back because sir hell no absolutely the fuck not and in the case where he's not even a fucking pussy and this is just his disrespectful ass being this way, why are we still there? I would leave and not come back. Why are we married to an overgrown man child? What has this man done to get into your good graces? Why does he deserve your time? What's going on? No, 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 no. This, no, babe, you deserve so much fucking better than a man that's gonna make sure that his birthday party is so good for his fucking friends and then turn around and forget his wife's. I don't understand. Babe, we have to have more respect and more, you know, self-esteem. Like, we deserve better. Hell no. Nah. Girl, let me know. I need you here pronto <laughs> Monday morning. I need to know what happened.
Am I the asshole for breaking up with my partner on our anniversary? Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. My partner, 25 male, and myself, 22 female, had our one year anniversary this past week. I am a college student, live with my roommate, and generally have a lot going on and am motivated to do well for myself. He dropped out of school a few years ago and lives at his parents' place. He has never had a driver's license or a car. When he worked, I would drive him to his job. He also quit his job six months ago voluntarily and has not tried to do anything else simply because he doesn't want to. At the beginning of us being together, we tried to contribute somewhat equally. But towards the end, it was me driving, providing food, etc. I even tried to have a conversation suggesting we try to work on individuality because when he, because he verbatim said to me, when I'm not with you, I just sit in my room. He believes he is working on his mental health and does not have the ability to do anything else. Taking on all the responsibility between the two of us was weighing on me, and the day I finally called it was the morning of our anniversary. Am I the asshole? Am I the asshole for making my boyfriend cut off his family? I am a single mother, and I found the love of my life. His name is Derek. He's been my best friend for years, and a relationship blossomed into this beautiful, trusting relationship. Oh, congrats. My child calls him dad, and we absolutely love him. Oh. We are very happy, and he is a good man. The problem I'm facing is with his dad, Stan. When Derek and I started talking before our relationship started, he was upfront with me about his dad's past. He confided in me that his dad had a sexual assault charge against him. Whoa, okay, all right. Ooh. He explained that it was a false accusation. <laughs> From when Stan was 18, he's in his 50s now. Years later, the girl confessed that she made it all up because she was upset when Stan broke up with her. Okay, well, nice. all right, this is wild That's, already. I don't know if this I agree. Is... If I sounds like she got bought off or something. Oh, oh, is there gonna be more details? To okay, well, not right. to that. Even with the false accusations, it still made me very uncomfortable. I get it. I expressed that to Derek, and he 100% supported my feelings. Hmm. He even said I could terminate a relationship if it was something I couldn't handle. Since Derek was honest, I decided that I could feel safe having a relationship with him. This was all done before I ever met Stan. Then I met Stan. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Stan made me very uneasy. He was always wanting hugs, and at one point in time, we were sitting on the couch, and he started stroking my feet. <laughs> what? <laughs> I hate this. Oh, no. This is the worst. When that happened, Derek stepped in and took me home because it was very obvious that I was uncomfortable. Good man. Good. Good, good, yeah. Not just that, but Stan constantly calls me beautiful <laughs> and that I have a nice figure. I hate this. He's also been very invasive in my life, calling oh my me at three in the morning or showing up to our house uninvited. I've expressed how much that bothers me to Derek, and he agreed. So we started setting hard boundaries with his dad. This is where I may be the asshole. How? Yeah, it's not. How? Dude. It's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil it. No, you're not. You're yeah, not the asshole. I'm not gonna, yeah. In fact, you probably saved, like, everyone. Every, All right, yeah, let's, okay. okay, yeah. I decided to do a full background check on Derek and his family. Derek even encouraged it since his family is so large. And also, you have a dad with a sexual assault yeah, charge. Yeah, literally, yeah. Who's I mean, the I know creepiest that one's, motherfucker alive. Like, I know alive. that one's, like, maybe shouldn't be there, but, like, <laughs> still he's creepy. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, you're right to do this. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, I looked up Stan and found a second sexual assault charge. What? On his record. Bro, who is this guy? Am I the asshole for going off on my fiancé for returning my wedding dress? I am a female 29, and my fiancé is a male 33. We're getting married soon. Wedding planning has so far been going alright, except for a few things he and I argued about, like the venue and flower girl. Now we've been arguing about my wedding dress. This might sound cliche, but ever since I was young, I dreamed of having my own beautiful wedding dress. I can afford it, but my fiancé thinks it's not okay to waste a couple of thousand dollars on a dress I'm only gonna wear once. Yes, he might have a point there, but for one, this is a typical price for wedding dresses, and two, because it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, then why not make sure it's special? My fiancé still wasn't convinced and suggested I rent a dress instead of buying one. He started saying that I'm being irresponsible with money and brought up how much money I've already put aside to rent a face. He means makeup and wear fake hair. He means extensions. 
but I have this vision of what I want to look like on my wedding, and I think that it's my right as a bride. I went ahead and purchased the dress, but a day later I found out that it was missing from my closet. I freaked out, but he told me he returned it and got the money back. I was shocked. I asked him why he did that, and he said he thought the dress was ridiculously expensive and that was wasting money and again suggested I go rent one. I blew up and went off on him, which I've never done before. He literally took a few steps back and told me to calm down. I said he had no right. I'm the one paying for the damn dress. He got upset and said there's no I'm paying it for myself in marriage and that my attitude is setting the tone for what type of dynamic we'll have in our marriage. He kept on about how I must expect him to pay for everything while I keep my money or spend it irresponsibly, but I never tell him how to spend his money. I responded that he gets zero say in how I spend my money whatsoever. He told me that I should grow the F up and stop with the dream wedding dress cliche, then stormed off to call his mom, who chewed me out saying she won't let me ruin her son's financial stability with how I deal with money generally. She too urged me to rent a dress or buy a cheaper one, way cheaper than the one I picked, and move on, but I declined. OP added, yes, he still has the money and said he'll give it back once we agree to a solution. I want to tell you a bit about my boyfriend of six years, Nick. He is one of the funniest and kindest people I know. He loves his family deeply and loves my family like they're his own. I've always been attracted to guys who are sensitive, so I was pretty stoked when I realized early on that he is the kind of guy who wears his heart on his sleeve. I could tell you so many wonderful things about our relationship over the last six years. But honestly, the best part about being by his side is that we never have to do much together to have a good time. Give me a long, mundane car trip with him and I'm sorted. Mm. So yeah, that's Nick and that's us. And for the most part, we are truly happy together. End of episode. Which brings me to the secret. <laughs> About three months into our relationship, I was lamenting to his mum and sister one evening that Nick was stalling on booking some flights for our upcoming overseas trip. I was desperate to book and couldn't understand why he kept delaying me. His mum and sister were originally a little evasive about it all, before eventually mentioning that at the age of just 21, he was carrying around a bunch of debt from gambling. Initially, I didn't quite believe them. Yeah, I thought, I guess we go to the pub pretty often and he does put a bet or two down when we're there, but doesn't everyone? A few days later, when we were lying in bed, Nick finally opened up to me about his serious gambling addiction. Since then, our relationship has been a roller coaster of highs and lows as he's battled his addiction in secret. Socially, I'm his rescuer. If we are out with friends and he heads to the bar to buy a drink, he will often text me, asking if I can transfer him some money. There have been other times when I have handed my bank card to him under the table so it looks like he is paying for things. I also get messages sometimes when, halfway through a workday, he realises he doesn't have any money to buy lunch. I guess it feels like I'm in a tug of war all the time. One minute I'm like, I absolutely have to leave. I'm in my 30s now and I need to think about my future. I find myself comparing my relationship to the ones around me and yearn for a time when my boyfriend can just shout me something as small as a coffee. But then I remember that gambling addiction is a disease and he isn't choosing this. He doesn't want this life either. Carrying the secret feels heavy. I've told my mum, dad and one friend. My best friend doesn't know because I get the sense she will be a little black and white about it all and tell me to leave. She doesn't understand addiction, so she won't understand Nick in all his complexity. At the moment, he is about to start recovery again after relapsing, and I find myself constantly wondering, is this what life is always going to be like? Do I even have the right to want to tell more people about this to ease the load? Is this my secret to share? Oh man, that is a lot. Wow. It is a very tricky situation. Am I the asshole for going home after my fiancé revealed that I had to pay for her birthday dinner with friends and family? My fiancé Rose, 31 female's birthday, was a few days ago. Usually she has a big celebration for her birthday every year. This year she wasn't really able to since she's been out of a job for a whole five months. She got depressed over the fact that she would have to have a small party at home and lately started talking me into funding her birthday celebration. She offered a number of compromises like picking out a cheaper restaurant and inviting less people. The answer was no and here's why. I have a five-year-old son with a chronic condition and I need every penny to be able to afford hospital bills. My fiancé kept begging me until I blew up at her and told her it won't happen. She stopped bringing it up after that. But out of the blue, she said she was going to have her birthday party at a restaurant and invite some family and friends. I said, really, that's great. I'm happy for you, but where'd you get the money? 
She said her parents would be paying for everything and said I should join them. We arrived at the restaurant, had dinner, drinks, and her birthday cake. We had a great time until the bill came. My fiancé put it in front of me and smiled nervously. I knew something was off with her behavior. I asked why she did that and she told me she lied about having her parents pay for the celebration and that she set this whole thing up to get me to pay just this time and she might consider paying me back later. I asked if she was kidding but she just stared at me. I was pissed but didn't want to make a scene in public after her parents tried to get me to suck it up and pay. I got up and grabbed my phone and turned to leave. She started shouting after me but I shouted back saying that I was just a guest and I had to go home then. I went home but she never came home. I found out she went with her parents and later had them send some nasty texts to me calling me self-centered, selfish, and unreasonable. They also accused me of prioritizing money over my future wife and pulling this nasty stunt on her birthday. I texted back saying she could have settled for a party at home, but she didn't. She refused to talk to me for now and her parents keep saying I embarrassed their daughter in front of everyone, including her friends. Am I the asshole for telling my sister that she can find somewhere else to stay if she can't take seeing my daughter? I, 27 female, have a 5-year-old foster daughter named May. She has been with me for around 8 months now and I love her to pieces. I'm considering adopting her. My sister, 31 female Kate, recently suffered a miscarriage and it took a real toll on her marriage. She's getting divorced from her husband and has been staying with me because she can't bear to live with him right now. Kate, however, has been a horrible guest to May. Every time May asks her for something or talks to her, Kate will burst into tears or yell at her. Kate is a great sister to me and I understand that she's grieving but that doesn't mean she can lash out at May for simply existing. I've told her off multiple times for yelling at May, but it all came to a head when I confronted her this morning. May had asked Kate if she could move so she could get a snack from the cabinet. Kate snapped at her and said, wait for a damn second, brat. I overheard from the living room and made Kate move out of the way and told her to apologize to May. Kate burst into tears saying that she just couldn't take having May here as a reminder of what she's lost. I told her she's a grown adult and should know better than to bully a child for her own problems. I told May to go to her room real quick and Kate and I got into a huge argument. I ended up telling her if she couldn't take seeing my foster daughter, she could find somewhere else to stay. She left to our parents' house and told them everything. I've been getting messages from her all day now. She told me I'm a horrible sister and said that she was grieving and asked how I could put someone else's kid over hers. I think that's a disgusting thing to send to anyone. Personally, I think she's being insensitive to me and my daughter's relationship. According to my mom, she's been crying for hours and won't stop talking about how I'm such a monster for not thinking of her feelings. I just don't think she has a right to yell at my kid because she lost hers. Update, I'm pregnant and being investigated by DCS. Here's the link to my original post. When I made it, I was advised to get a lawyer right away. I was also advised that Indiana's DCS doesn't investigate pregnant women who don't already have kids and that the woman claiming to be a social worker might be an imposter. I contacted and met with a lawyer and explained the situation to him. He seemed to agree that something was very fishy. To make a long story short, the woman, quote, handling our case has no affiliation with the Department of Child Services. Oh my God. I am still in complete shock. We went straight to the police. They're taking this very seriously. I can't give a lot of details because it's an ongoing investigation, but she seems to have been a very skilled slash well-researched liar. I never would have known anything was amiss without the advice of this subreddit and the intervention of my attorney. I feel like a complete idiot but the instinct to cooperate unquestionably when faced with an intimidating authority figure is strong. I haven't had the baby yet. We're staying at a trusted family member's home until the baby is born. My OB in the hospital will be delivering at, have already been informed of the situation, and will be taking the appropriate security measures. I'm still freaking out, but we're taking every precaution for the safety of my child, and hopefully everything will turn out okay. Thanks again, everybody. Truly. Oh my God. Reddit like saved her. I was literally just going to say. Story time about my scariest experience being home alone. When I was 14, I lived with my grandparents. They lived in an old bungalow type of house. It was one story and we had stairs that went right up to the attic. No one ever used the attic and it was just used to store things. My room door was near the stairs leading up to the attic, which I hated because I always got scared something would crawl down when I left my room. One night, my grandparents had to pick up my aunt's family from the airport. They wouldn't be back until early morning. I told them that I'd be safe at home overnight. We lived in a gated community with guard dogs and I thought everything would be okay. Before they left, we had an early dinner and I was stuck doing the dishes. While I was doing this, I could hear the neighboring dogs barking 
parking lot, but I didn't think much of it because they always did that. After cleaning, I locked every window, shut off the lights, and headed to bed. When I entered my room, the lights were on and everything looked completely normal. I had barred and tinted windows because my grandparents didn't want anyone peeping in my room since it was a one-story house. They were barred because when my uncle was younger, he'd always sneak out, so they put bars on the window to prevent him from doing that. When I turned off the lights to go to bed, I saw a silhouette of a man illuminated by the streetlights standing outside of my window. I thought I was hallucinating. When I turned on the lights, he was gone. When I turned them off, he was there. Part 2 of my scariest experience when I was home alone. When I turned the lights on and off the third time, the man's figure wasn't there either time. I sighed in relief and thought my mind was just playing tricks on me or that something was casting a shadow. I double locked my door to be safe with one on the doorknob and one of those latch type locks. I tucked myself in bed and tried to fall asleep even though the dogs were still barking outside. When I was finally falling asleep, I heard something above me moving. Something in the attic. I pushed the thought down and hugged my pillow, telling myself it was just rats. My heart sank when I heard someone hurriedly go down the stairs and stop at the bottom. I covered myself with a blanket and waited, wishing my grandparents had given me a phone for a time like this. Suddenly, I heard my door not being gently fiddled. I wanted to vomit when I heard a click followed by a quiet turn of the knob. It turned, but it didn't budge. When they noticed, they tried to push it. I finally stood up and softly pushed my body against the door, locking everything up again. I didn't want to make a sound. I don't know why they stopped, but they did. Then I heard footsteps go up the stairs as I sat there. I saw something move in the corner of my eye and there outside of my window was the shadow. I forced my eyes closed and ignored it until I fell asleep. All I remember is the next day I was having breakfast with my family. I brought it up to my grandparents, but they scoffed that it was probably rats. I never brought it up again, but the attic window had been opened. Story time about how a stranger hunted me through a national park. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington near Mount Rainier. Not the official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected to see another human for miles. One night, I wake up and hear something. I open my tent and was surprised to see a guy sitting where my fire had been right outside of my tent. He looked like a regular guy, but he was sitting just a couple feet away from my tent and it made me uneasy. I also noticed that he didn't have a bag or pack or anything with him. When he saw me open my tent, his eyes widened like he had just seen a ghost and he bolted off. It shook me to my core at first, but over the next day, I managed to put it out of my mind. I thought to myself that it was just an odd occurrence and that I was probably on drugs or something. I made myself believe that he had somehow managed to set up a camp not far from mine and it was just a coincidence. Two days after this, I had hiked another 15 miles in totally random directions that nobody could take the same path as on accident. I was sitting by the fire that night and I started hearing noises. I was convinced there was someone there. I called out to them and out of the darkness, someone asked me, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I quickly said no and I don't even think that's a real place there. However, they kept talking to me from just out of my line of vision. It only got creepier from here. Part 2 about a stranger hunting me through a national park. I grabbed my flashlight and tried to see them, but they yelled at me to aim it away. This spooked me and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person, I did. After about 15 minutes, the voice was still asking me random questions from the darkness. I was so freaked out and it sounded like it had gotten closer. I built up the courage and shined my light in the direction that the voice was coming from. It was the same dude who had been outside my tent two nights before. I realized that he had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days because there was no way that he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot in such a vast wilderness. At this point, I knew it was no coincidence. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. This time, I started to chase him, but I didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark and stopped after only 100 to 200 feet. I decided the trip was over the next morning and hiked back over three days, constantly doubling back and trying to throw anyone off my trail. I would also occasionally hide and wait to see if he would come by following me. On the first night hiking out, I heard what sounded like a person walking in circles outside of my tent twice, but by the time I mustered the courage to look, there was nothing. The whole hike back, I had knots in my stomach. I almost cried when I finally got back to my car and the relief washed over me. I, female 25, husband, male 28, said something disgusting to me. I can't stop thinking of it. I've been in the bath for a long time because I've been dreading going to bed with him. A few hours ago, I was lying in bed feeding our baby. My husband was begging me to come do something with him. I tried to tell him to wait a few moments, and he kept glaring at me and telling me to hurry up. I just gave birth a couple months ago, and my husband has been so jealous of his own son. I could see he was starting to lose his patience, and I told him, honey, I have to take care of him before. You know that. And what he said back was really stunning. He looked me right in the eyes and said if you love him so much why don't you his instead of mine i couldn't say anything fucking gross i didn't even know what to say and then he stormed out of our bedroom i don't even know what to make of this what should i do it just bothers me so deeply it's going to be hard for me to forgive i really don't have any other complaints about my husband most days things are great with him but that just made me sick to my stomach am i being sensitive maybe i'm just emotional but i feel like crying i hate hearing stories like this and there's been a couple that have come up recently where um um, there was one on Amy's episode mm-hmm. where there was this dad and like every time he would go and put the baby to bed, he would whisper things to the baby and be like, I fucking hate you. Crazy oh shit. Oh my God. He'd just whisper this crazy shit to the baby. I don't remember. Like that's not a direct quote, you guys, but mm-hmm. it was bad shit. And I feel like this is kind of on that level where if he is so insecure and not just insecure at this point, like he actually resents his child. Like making a comment like that makes me feel like he doesn't like his child at all. Like he, mm-hmm. he sees his child as a direct threat to 
his wife. Right. This feels so territorial. And it's like, this is your baby. This is your baby. This is half of you. Mm -hmm. And you're threatened by your baby. Do you think it would have been different if their baby was female? Maybe. Do you think it was some weird? I don't know. I just think like maybe the little boy thing has something to do with it. But that's like, honestly, a very surprising reaction Mm -hmm. because of how many gender reveal videos that you see that are guys getting upset over girls and even not even guys like moms get upset over girls i saw a gender reveal video today of a mom crying because she found out she was having a little girl oh my god i want a girl you don't usually see this with boys like unless it's like she's got four boys and this is the fifth baby and she just wanted a little girl Mm -hmm. then you might see it but if you know you might be disappointed don't have public gender reveals besides the point so true i think he's just a little off his rocker right now like this is a little scary to the point i wouldn't trust him alone with the baby no i agree it's not so i've heard about stuff like this and i don't have a child so i don't know what it feels like to be jealous of a baby like that seems crazy to me but at the same time like i don't know what that person's going through yeah um but to say those words is just the most repulsive thing especially when like that is an issue that's an actual real serious scary issue so to even say that because you're mad you're jealous like it goes beyond just whatever he's going through it's just like he took it way too far it's disgusting repulsive like no one should ever say those words am i the asshole for telling my 40 male wife 31 female that i work hard and feel unappreciated my wife and i have been together for almost 11 years and we have two beautiful kids i love her more than anything but she gets overly pushy a lot of the time about what i apparently should be doing as a husband which is more than what i view as my half of our relationship (laughs) i'm hard working Mm. I've been working for my company since I was 22, and I've climbed to the, to a more than comfortable pay grade with plenty of benefits. Good for you, bud. My wife decided to quit her low-paying retail job after our first kid and became a stay-at-home mom with an Etsy store on the side. I respect all that she does, but her job is honestly to just stay home all day with our family, quote, clean. No, it's not. She has a job on the side. <laughs> quote, clean. <laughs> our house parentheses she acts like this is the biggest part of her job but sounds, our house is never is. close to messy and our oldest has chores to help make jewelry and cook meals people may hate me but honestly it's an easy life and sometimes i think most people would like to do over a nine to five what do you do you push papers <laughs> she says that this is her half and my half should be this is a form of a literal list she has written me a take her on a date once a week and it should regularly be a nice one. Oh, nice Two, yeah. provide her with some extra money each month for non necessities like hair entertainment etc mm. three take her vac- take her on quote vacation with me to a work retreat in Hawaii and d take some take some time off once a month to go out with the family <laughs> The last one is impossible. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> my that- job is my job is too competitive, and I'm lucky that I get Christmas off. I can't take her to my work retreat. A few people are bringing their spouses, but I know she's just going to demand my attention away from the actual reason I'm there. Also, we would have to spend thousands on childcare, as we have no relatives who would be willing to come to watch the children. The others. She makes income from her Etsy store for anything she may need for herself, and I already pay for literally everything else we have and do. I take her out for special occasions. I don't have the spare time between being on call and being at work to do it once a week. If she wanted to go so bad, she could take me, but she hasn't taken me on a date since we first got engaged. I feel so unappreciated by her words. Her treating my overtime and cram schedule as my fuck up and not a blessing to our family really opens my eyes to how she perceives us. This is what happens when you marry a capitalist, ladies. Literally, yeah. I told her about my schedule and how busy I was, and she accused me of lying and possibly cheating. Which I am not. I snapped back and asked how dare she when I take care of both of our lives by working while she gets to stay home with the family and do her hobbies. I said I feel unappreciated and that I've given it's literally a job and that I've already given her the world. Am I the asshole? Yes. In what most dangerous ways have you encountered a madman before you could encounter a madman? Story time. So when I was in school, whenever I go to see my boyfriend, he always sees me back home. And he doesn't have a car at this point, so what we do is that we normally get Okada to come back home. All the time, I normally like the feeling that there's a bouncer sitting behind me. Like, I normally like the two in one package, but Baba was not a fan of that. He's always like, uh uh-uh, uh, we don't be past like that now. Now, poor people, they climb to you. <laughs> That's what people normally feel like. You guys don't have the money and all that. So that day, we climbed two different Okada. 
he said instead of going to the house direct let's go to somewhere hang out before he'll take me home i said no wahala i climbed my okada he climbed his own okada he normally likes my okada being in front of his okada so we were in front going at a point i noticed he wasn't behind me so i told the okada man please hold on let's wait for him a little bit he waited for almost three to five minutes and he wasn't still showing up so i called him where are you now he said sorry he forgot something at home so he went to pick it up i said i beg hurry up the okada man head and was like ah you go settle me you because me i'm not here wait and i said to him i said no problem just be good i dropped and that road i dropped is really not too lonely but it's a lonely road like this kind of roads that in five minutes you get to see only two or three people passing so i dropped there was this guy standing there i sure didn't look him from head to toe i saw him just partially and he was on suit so i stood beside like in my own corner in my own space because i don't like problem and i'm the type of lady that whenever i'm standing and the guy is standing close to me i try to find activities to do because i don't want me and your eye jamming or looking at each other it's like we are crushing on each other already i beg go and i don't want long talk so what i do is that i'll pretend i'm pressing my phone and calling someone or i'll just pretend i'm shadowing something or just form activity arranging my trouser or something <laughs> so that was what i was actually doing i was trying to call my guy i was pretending i was speaking on phone with my guy <laughs> i'm the mad person because i'm calling someone who is not really on phone with me i was shout talking for me as if i was speaking on phone so this guy doesn't come close to me the next thing i turned and i didn't see this guy where he was standing so i thought he might have gone i felt a gentle hug from behind and this guy pegged me so i turned i was like who is this person i thought it's someone i knew and i was like who is this person i saw it was that guy i said oh god are you mad or something are you stupid you know you're harassing me at this point oh you just come and hug me and peg me do i know you i shouted at him and the next thing he slapped me we started fighting this guy beats me to support <laughs> guys i'm running out of time let's meet for part two the way this guy beats me like i know he imagine waiting i passed through that particular time again because it was so traumatic <laughs> some guys were now coming from far running and we're like bola 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 kadena bola in house is like dustbin if they call him dustbin stop him dustbin stop him i said bola kadena waiting i don't get <laughs> before you could reach my guy reached already in short he started messing this guy up without even asking for explanation i was so proud of my guy at the moment because this guy dealt with me <laughs> Before they now reached the next thing, they held my guy. They were holding my guy instead of holding that guy. That please calm down, bro, calm down. Mo explain, calm down. May explain waiting. You've been there here. And they were like, ay, 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 <laughs> No vex. Na madman. My guy did ginger. He said for waiting. So I'm of them mad. They, they said no. Like really, he's a madman. They call him Bola. Bola fucked me up. <laughs> that was when I saw his full view. This guy was wearing a suit with bra. I felt I felt ashamed at this point fighting with a madman. He was wearing a suit with bra, pantyhose, and two different slippers. Bola now headed to there was one dustbin actually close by. Bola now headed to the dustbin and was picking things, putting his mouth and was crying. Mama, Mama, oh my God! Bola dealt with me that day that I have serious phobia for mad people. I don't know why in Nigeria you get to walk on the same road with mad people. Like, we don't really have a particular place that we keep these people to treat them and all that. But in some civilized countries, you can see they have all these things. Um, I have serious phobia for mad people from that day. I had major injuries on my knee my right leg, and my left leg. Maybe small thing I see that day. They treated my leg. <laughs> I was still seeing double. I was traumatized. Since from that day, if I see madman for streets, the way they meander, the way they turn sharp corner, 